Let's turn in our Bibles now to the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians. Where Paul asked, first of all, the question, dare any of you having a matter against another, and this another is a brother in the body of Christ. Uh, as Paul will um, declare uh, in verse 6, but brother goeth to law with brother. So if you have a matter against your brother, another, dare you go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? The Greek society was a very litigious society. And everybody, it seems, was involved in court issues many times during their life. People were ready to sue over anything. And when you filed a suit, you were first of all provided an arbiter, each side, who would listen to the case, and a third arbiter would also be involved and they would seek arbitration to come to an amicable settlement. If it could not be settled that way, then you would again go to court, and this time before, and they had large juries of a hundred or so. Now, uh, I don't know how they ever came to a uh, solution or a conviction. No, it's interesting. Um, of course, just recently, uh, the aspects of the legal system have uh, surely been exposed. Uh, the jury system, it, it seems extremely uh, strange uh, how that one jury can uh, declare a man innocent and another jury declare him guilty, and both of them with unanimous kinds of decisions, um, which only points up that the worldly system is faulty at best. So Paul is sort of rebuking them for taking the issues that they have with another brother before the pagan courts. He is saying that these issues between brother and brother in the church ought to be resolved in the church by those within the church and not in the heathen courts. For he goes on to ask, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Now, when Christ returns, he will sit in judgment to judge the nations of the world. And as he reigns during the thousand-year reign, we will be participating with him in that reign over the earth. And so this is probably what Paul is referring to when he talks about the saints will be judging the world. And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge in the smallest matters? I mean, here are the issues of the world that we will be dealing with as we reign and rule with Christ over the earth. Uh, can't we resolve some of these small issues within the church that arise sometimes between a brother and brother? And then Paul said, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Now, again, 
the Bible isn't specific as far as which angels we are going to judge. Um, I don't think that we will be judging the good angels. Uh, some of you may wonder where your guardian angel was when you smashed your car and uh, may like to sort of question him, you know, of, was he off somewhere, asleep or negligent? Uh, but uh, I don't think that that's the issue that's involved here. Uh, but probably the fallen angels and somehow we will be brought into that area of judgment of the angels. Now, these are in spiritual matters. Now, you see, we ought to be able to judge in these small matters because we're going to be judging in international matters as we judge the world. We're going to be judging in spiritual matters as we judge angels. Therefore, surely, you know, if someone borrowed a shovel from you and didn't return it, we ought to be able to resolve those issues in the church without taking them to court. So how much more, if we're going to be judging in spiritual matters, are we and should we be capable of judging in matters that pertain to this life? The issues, the differences that we experience in this life. If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. Now, uh, this is sort of a slap, I, I would suppose, at the judicial system where Paul is saying a person who is least esteemed in the church should be capable of judging the issues that arise in the family of God. The least esteemed. In other words, you don't bother the uh, people who are uh, actually uh, in the... Uh, Ministry in the church, take those that are least esteemed uh, to judge. Paul has pointed out that the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Yet Paul said, He that is spiritual understands all things, though he is not understood. In other words, a man who is filled with the Holy Spirit, who does not have a Harvard education, is a better teacher of spiritual matters than some professor who knows all of the original languages and uh, has the years of seminary training but who is not born again. You see, when we are born again of the Spirit, we come into a spiritual understanding. There is a Greek word Gnosko, which is to know by experience or by study. There is another Greek word, oidus, which is just to know by intuition, an intuitive or knowledge that comes from the Spirit. And thus, a person who only has the gnosko, the knowledge by experience or the knowledge by study, is missing out on a whole dimension of understanding in the scriptural things. Because the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit, neither can he know them. Thus he cannot be a competent guide to the scriptures. They talk often of, of these scholars who get together to determine which of the passages in the Gospels are truly those of Jesus Christ and which of them actually are spurious or, or 
additions by the uh, gospel writers. And uh, here they are, they all have their degrees behind their names, but they are unregenerate, they're not born again. And thus their conclusions are totally unreliable because they're coming at it just from a critical analysis of the text, the natural man who does not understand the things of the Spirit and neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So you're better off listening to some person who maybe doesn't even have a high school education but who has studied the scriptures, walked in the spirit, living in the spirit, God has opened up to him a dimension of truth that cannot be found in the seminaries by, that are taught by natural men. So if you have matters of judgment, take the person who is le least esteemed in the church. Let him judge. And Paul said, I speak this to your shame. Shame on you. Going to court. Uh, don't you realize that you're exposing the, the things of the Lord to pagan courts and so forth? So he questions, is it so that there's not a wise man among you? Don't you have anyone in the body that's wise enough to deal with this? Uh, no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. Don't you have anyone? Isn't there someone there that can judge in the issues between the brothers that you can bring a resolution to these things? Now, in our times, we do have the benefit of Christian arbitration. There are a group of attorneys who do Christian arbitration. So if we have a case of brother with brother that cannot be resolved, these attorneys will listen to the issues and will arbitrate the issues so that you don't have to go to court. It not only saves a tremendous amount of money, but it also uh, is, is a good thing where Christians can resolve their differences within a Christian environment rather than in the environment of the courtroom. And so Paul goes on to rebuke them, saying, But brother is going to law with a brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law with another. It would be better if you would just suffer the wrong. Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Better than to go to an unbelieving court. No, Paul said, you do wrong and you defraud and that your brethren. Now, in the previous chapter, Paul, in dealing with some of the problems of immorality in the church of Corinth, in verse 11 said, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, don't even eat with them. Sad, but in the church of Corinth there were those who were defrauding others in the body of Christ. Terrible things in Corinth. Hey, wait a minute. In the church today, there are those who are guilty of defrauding others in the body of Christ. We have had many issues where people who have claimed to be Christians have defrauded one another. 
The love of money, the Bible said, is the root of all evil. And it is tragic how that when money is involved, people can quickly lose their spirituality, their commitment, and greed can set in so readily. So it was, it was wrong. It was happening. There was extortion and fraud that was going on in the church of Corinth. Just because a person puts a fish on his business card doesn't mean that you should blindly trust him, but use good judgment. Be prudent, because you're apt to be taken. Not all who say, Lord, Lord. Not all who say, bless God, brother, I'll be glad to do that for you, you know. Won't cost you much. Look out. Get a contract. <laughs> be wise. So, there are always those who look upon Christians as patsies taking advantage and ready to take advantage of them because we've been taught to trust. And thus, they look upon us as an easy mark. It's sad that these things have to be brought up, but Paul had to bring them up in the church of Corinth, and people are people in every generation. Now Paul goes on to say, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. Because you go to church, because you regularly attend, if you are engaged in these practices, don't be deceived into thinking that your church attendance is going to cover your sin. If you are in fornication, if you are an idolater, that is, if there are other things in your life that supersede your commitment to Jesus Christ, if you are an adulterer engaged in an extramarital affair, if you are effeminate, and in the Greek that is a uh, male prostitute, homosexual prostitute, or those that abuse themselves with mankind, and in the Greek that is those who are homosexuals, who are seeking that homosexual prostitute. One, the, the, uh, one refers to the one who takes the female role, the effeminate, and the other is the one who takes the male role in homosexuality. Or thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, or revilers. Don't be deceived. These people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. When Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians, he exhorted them to walk in love, as Christ also has loved us, Ephesians 5, verse 2. 
Walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness, that is, sexual impurities, covetousness, let it not once be named among you as becometh the saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, that is, uh, in, in a sexual purity sense, or a covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Don't let any man deceive you. Now, Paul said to the Corinthians, don't be deceived on this issue. Now, as Paul brings up much the same thing to the church in Ephesus, he said, don't let any man deceive you. Tell you, well, it's all right. You know, if you've once been born again, it's all right. It doesn't matter. Don't let any man deceive you with vain words because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the children of disobedience. This is why God's wrath and judgment is coming upon the earth. Peter said the time has come when judgment must begin at the house of God. But it begins, if it begins with us, where is the sinner and the ungodly going to appear? Now notice, as he tells you that you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God, he said, don't let anybody deceive you on this. Writing to the Corinthians, he said, don't be deceived. Now when Paul wrote his letter to the Galatians, Paul, in writing to the Galatians in chapter 5, He said to them, verse 17, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, which again is sexual impurity, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell, have told you before, and I've told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So once again, Paul is warning the church about these practices that will exclude you from the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. And in verse 7 of chapter 6, he said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So many people are deceived on these issues, thinking that you can live however you please in sexual impurities, in idolatry, and in revilings, that is, cutting people apart with your words, destroying people's reputation with your words. They think that they can do these things and still inherit the kingdom of God. Paul said, God's wrath is coming upon the world for these very things. These are the things that are uh, per precipitating the judgment of God that is coming. And so as he speaks of these things, back in verse 11, he said, and such were some of you. <laughs> Past life, before you came to Jesus Christ, yes, a lot of junk, a lot of filth. We don't have anything to be proud of back there. Some of you, but you've been washed 
Oh, thank God. Come now, the Lord said, let's reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, you can be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, you can be as white as wool. What a glorious scripture. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses a man from all sin. Such were some of you, but you've been washed. Thank God for that washing of the regeneration of the word of God by which we've been cleansed. But more than that, you've been sanctified. Now, this means you've been set apart, apart from that old life. Apart from the things of the old life, you've been sanctified. Set apart from that. The work of God's Spirit within our hearts and within our lives. The word sanctify means to be set apart for a exclusive purpose and use. In the Old Testament, when they made the tabernacle, the vessels that were, be, were to be used in the service of the tabernacle, they were sanctified so that those vessels that were used in the worship in the tabernacle were not to be used for any other purpose. There was a singular purpose. These vessels are set apart for our worship of God. And they're not to be used for any other purpose. So our lives have been sanctified. God has set us apart that we now belong to Him exclusively. He wants that exclusive right over your life over your body. You've been sanctified. And then, more than that, you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. You've been declared innocent of all of these things that you once were guilty of. These things that you did when you lived your life in the flesh. God has washed those things from your life. He has set you apart now for himself and he declares you innocent of all charges, sanctified before God. So Paul declares all things are lawful for me. Christ is the end of the law to those that believe. The law was a schoolmaster to drive us to Jesus Christ. The law was for the lawless. If a person is living after the Spirit, following after God, serving the Lord, he has been set free from the bondage of the flesh, these things that used to be a part of our lives. But not only that, we've been set free to serve God with everything that we have. And so all things are now lawful for me because my purpose and my desire is to live a totally sanctified life set apart for His use. My body now belongs to Him and, and it's for His use. And thus, in this mode, all things are lawful. Now, if you have not yet come to Jesus Christ, the law still has power over you, and you're going to be judged by the law. It's only when you come to Christ that you become free from the law. And there's now a new law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has set me free from the law that had condemned me to death. But until a person comes to Christ, the law is still there, binding, and you're responsible to it. Once you've come to this new life in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation. All things are lawful for me, 
but I am really held by a higher standard. All things are not expedient. Because of this new life in Christ, it is my desire, it is my purpose and intent to run this race and win. As Paul said, they that run in a race run all, only one receives the prize, so run that you might obtain. We are told, seeing we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience this race that is set before us as we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We're in a race, a race to win, and thus, Though some practice may be lawful for me, you may prove that it, as a Christian, it is, is all right for you to do. Of course, this is, would not include the previous list because as a Christian, you wouldn't do those things. And if you do those things, it's evident that you're not a Christian. But you can prove that it's all right to do, but does it impede your progress towards the goal? I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God which is in Christ Jesus. As I'm pressing towards this goal, I don't want anything that will impede my progress towards the goal. As we mentioned this morning, if you were running the 100 meter dash in the Olympics, and if you came out and set up there at the blocks and you had big heavy boots on, people would think you're crazy, and they'd probably be right. You're not going to win the race if you're wearing those heavy boots. They're going to be an encumbrance. They're going to impede your achieving victory in the race. And there are things that may be all right, but they will impede your running the race. So though it may be lawful, it's not expedient. All things are lawful for me, Paul said, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now you talk about liberty. I don't know of any greater liberty that a person can declare than all things are lawful for me. I mean, that's absolute. I mean, you don't get any more than that as far as liberty is concerned. And as a Christian, we have been set free. We were once living in bondage to our flesh and our fleshly desires. There are a lot of things that people do and they hate themselves for doing them, but it's the weakness of the flesh. As Jesus said to Peter, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And I've talked to so many people who are engaged in activities that they hate. And, and Paul the Apostle said, that which I do not allow, I do. And he talked about how frustrated he was because of the power of the flesh. Until he finally cried, who shall deliver me? He did everything he could to deliver himself and found out that he was still bound by the fleshly desires, impulses. So he finally cried, who shall deliver me? And then he found that strength outside of himself through Jesus Christ. Thank God, through Jesus Christ. And the life and the walk and the spirit, I've been set free from the bondage to the flesh. Now, having been set free, I come into this glorious sense of liberty and freedom. I'm no longer a slave or subject unto my flesh and the fleshly desires. I've been liberated. But it is possible for a person to exercise their liberty in such a way as to bring them back into bondage. If I exercise my liberty to smoke cigarettes, if I so desire... 
And if I become addicted to the nicotine, then I'm no longer free anymore. I'm now a slave to this little cigarette. I've exercised my freedom in a, such a way as it brought me into bondage. That's not wise. Adam had perfect liberty in the garden. In a sense, he could say, all things are lawful for me, <laughs> but that tree in the middle. He had the freedom to do what he pleased. He had the freedom to eat of any tree in the garden that he pleased, but he was warned, don't eat of that tree. That'll bring you into bondage. That'll bring you into debt. But he had the freedom God didn't tie him up in a corner of the garden, nor did God build a high wall around that tree. He had the freedom to eat of it. But he exercised that freedom in such a way as to bring death and bondage to sin and to the flesh. As he obeyed the desires of the flesh rather than the word of God and the commandment of God, he then found himself a victim to his flesh. So, I will not be brought under the power of any. Enjoying my glorious liberty in Christ, I will not be so foolish as to exercise it in participating or taking of things, involving myself in certain activities that can bring me under their power. Because once I'm under the power of any kind of activity, then I'm no longer free. So Paul said, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. This was probably a proverb in Corinth. One of those worldly proverbs which, by which they were saying, hey, you know, meats for the belly, the belly for meats. It doesn't really matter what you eat, you know. Meats for the belly and the belly's for meat. So that... You know, it doesn't matter. But Paul responds, God is going to destroy both of them. I mean, these things are temporal things. What you eat and all, those are temporal things. Those things are going to pass. Now the body, he said, is not for fornication. Uh, they were probably carrying that proverb over into the physical sense of fornication. In other words, God gave me sexual powers. God created the sex drive. Meats for the belly, the belly for meats. God created me with certain sexual organs, and so, you know, they're for sexual practice and carrying this, this proverb over into the realm of fornication. Now the body, he said, is not for fornication. That's not why God created you with certain sexual capacities. But the body is for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, and he will also raise us up by his own power. The resurrection. God has created us for himself. Our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are not our own. So even as God raised up the body of Jesus, so shall God raise us up by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? We've been joined unto Jesus Christ, our bodies. He talked to the Corinthians and he said, now, uh, the church is a body of Christ, members in particular, parts of the body of Christ. 
We've been joined to Christ in the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, being the body of Christ. And, and Paul tells us not to yield our members as instruments for unrighteousness, but yield our members as instruments of righteousness unto the Lord. That is, your body itself. Yield it to God for His use, not for the fulfilling of your sexual drives. Your bodies are the members of Christ, and shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? God forbid. Here my body is a member of Christ. It's to be used for Him. I'm to yield it as an instrument for Him to use for His purposes. Shall I then take this body which is a member of Christ and go out and have an affair with a prostitute? God forbid, Paul said. What? Know you not that he which is joined to a prostitute is one body? You've become one with her, but here you are, a member of Christ, and now you're taking this member of Christ's body and joining it to a harlot or a prostitute, and thus you're bringing Christ into that relationship. Paul said this is unthinkable. It's just shocking. Because the Lord has said concerning this sexual union that the two become one. And thus, in, in, a, in a sense, you're joining Christ in, in this relationship. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Thus, flee fornication. It is important that we have purposed in our hearts to live a life of moral purity. We read in the book of Daniel that he purposed in his heart not to defile his body with the king's meat. That's the purpose. I've purposed in my heart. I'm not going to do it. And we need to make these kinds of purposes in our hearts. I'm not going to commit fornication. You see, the time to make your decision isn't when she's standing before you naked. And then do I decide, well, shall I, shall I not? That isn't the time the decision is made. The decision is made long before. So that if that should arise, it isn't a thing that can I be, or shall I, or it's something that's already been predetermined. I'm purpose not to defile myself with a king's meat. I've purpose not to commit fornication. And it is something that is purposed long in advance and needs to be a part of our whole process of thinking concerning my body. It's an instrument of God to be used by God in the accomplishing of His purposes. And thus, I'll not defile my body because I'm not going to bring Christ into some kind of an ungodly relationship. Flee fornication. We remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. How that he had established and purposed in his heart. I'm God's child. I'm a part of God's people. So that when Potiphar's wife sought to entice him. How can I do this thing? Others may do it, but how can I? I am special. I belong to God. My belo body belongs to Him. How can I do this evil? 
so that even when she grabbed him, intending to force him into bed with her, he fled, flee fornication. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, flee youthful lust. Every sin that a man does is without the body. They are outside. But he that commits fornication sinneth against his own body. That's something that is within. What? <laughs> All of these what's of Paul. I mean, he's sort of preposterous. Don't you, you know, what? I mean, can't, don't you know? Can't you see? What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Don't you realize that? Your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's dwelling in you. The Holy Spirit dwelling in you, which is in you, which you have of God, God's glorious gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. When on the day of Pentecost and the people were all gathered together and as Peter preached, they came under conviction by the Holy Spirit and they began to say, men and brethren, what shall we do? We blew it. We crucified the Lord of glory. Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so he is of God. You have the Holy Spirit from God, God's gift to you. He's dwelling in you. And thus, you are not your own. It's my body. I can do as I please. Isn't that the whole thing we're hearing today, this, this pro-choice thing? My body, I can do with it what I please. I have a right to do with my body. Well, that may be true of the person in the world, but it is not true of the child of God. It's not your body anymore. It's been redeemed. You've been bought with a price. You were once a slave, enslaved to the lust of your flesh. But Jesus purchased you with his own blood. He redeemed you from that lost enslaved state that you might be free now to serve him and to worship him. For you have been bought with a price, Paul said. Therefore, because of this, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. And therefore, I live to glorify God and to please Him because He owns me. I have no right of my own. I have relinquished that right to Him. He's redeemed me from that old life of destruction, of death, of misery, of indulgence. He has delivered me that I might live now unto him in the newness of life in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, help us. These are vital, important issues that we need to give careful attention to as the children of God. May God help us to realize that I belong to him. This body in which I live is now the temple of the Holy Spirit who's dwelling in me. I'm not my own. He bought me with the price. And therefore, it is my duty, my obligation to glorify him through this body. Paul the Apostle declared his desire that Christ be glorified in his body. That's, that's my desire, he said. 
whether by life or by death, I don't care. It's just that I want Christ to be glorified in my body. That was his purpose for living. For me to live as Christ, die as gain. But as long as I'm living in this body, I want Christ to be glorified in this body. And that should be the desire of each of us. That Christ be glorified in our bodies because they're really his. Shall we pray? Father, may the Holy Spirit take and impress these truths upon our hearts. That we would not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Lest we just deceive ourselves as seems to be such an easily th and, and such an easy thing to do as we are warned over and over in the scriptures about self-deception lord help us that we might live in the spirit and walk in the spirit and recognize lord that our bodies are the temple of the holy spirit which dwells in us which we have from you Lord, we commit ourselves, our bodies, as living sacrifices. May they be holy, Lord, and acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, I surrender all, I surrender To Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. And may indeed we each of us surrender all. Paul said that's your reasonable service. This isn't something, you know, really greater. That's reasonable. If your body belongs to him, then it's only reasonable that you surrender your body as an instrument of righteousness that he might use you for his purpose and for his glory. God bless you.